Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer. Welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly interview show where I learn a little bit more about somebody else's perspective on movies. And joining me for a second time, one of my fellow Sif Pop collaborators, Jacob Kidman. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me, Shane. Absolutely. And this is indeed the second time coming on and get to these second round questions. But before I do, Jacob, is there anything you'd like to shamelessly plug to all the wonderful listeners? Um, well, you can always check me out uh, at uh, Jacob underscore Kinman on Instagram. Uh, it's my most active social media. Um, also, J.H. Kinman on Letterboxd, where I'm rating and reviewing uh, what I'm watching. I've got my uh, 2023 rankings on there right now. As I'm as I'm slowly catching up to those movies, you can ch uh, check those out. Um, and then uh, next month in March for SifPop.com, I've got uh, the review for Immaculate coming out, uh, the new oh, City Shady movie. Um, so I'm looking forward to writing that up. And uh, I've got a Sif Pop Writers Room appearance coming up sometime. <laughs> it's on the calendar, so uh, <laughs> that'll be fun. Uh, check that out uh, sometime in March, I believe. So yeah, two, two quick thoughts. One, do you re like do you really review films if you don't have a letterbox at this point? <laughs> exactly. And uh, 2023, I feel like this has been a hard year to mm -hmm. like catch up with everything a lot and of like stuff. big stuff because boy, are they making it difficult. Mm -hmm. Like, why is it that one of the top animated film nominees for best animated feature isn't coming out until may like robot dreams oh yeah it's like where's this movie that is i actually didn't know that that's weird yeah like it came, came out in like november it uh -huh. had a november release date and then it's like nope may i'm like it's already almost halfway into the next year mm. So yeah, there's definitely yeah. a few that it's getting particularly frustrating. But um you also reminded me I will be having a Sif Pop Writers Room episode coming up for our uh redoing of the Oscars. So if you have five hours to listen, that episode will be coming your way in a couple weeks. Okay. <laughs> we'll see if we can uh, find you're redoing this year's Oscars or what uh, year? So like last year, 2000 uh the 22 films which spoiler alert i feel like everything everywhere all at once are gonna be it's like i'm not gonna be changing a whole lot of those victories yeah. <laughs> but we'll see sure no i mean yeah i there, there is maybe one or two i would change myself but yeah no i i think that still wins best picture i'm going to be fighting for banshees to at least win one oscar redone it makes me so sad about oh, that. Yeah. Uh, right. No, I mean, that would be my number two for best picture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Speaking of previously released Crystal. films, let's get started. So, Jacob, what's a previously released film that you have not seen that you're most excited to actually check out? You know, Shane, there's a couple different ways I could have gone with this. I've got a very, very long list of shame of <laughs> classic movies, newer movies, Fair. you know, that's overwhelming. I'm constantly trying to catch up with that. Um, so I didn't even try to pick something from there. Okay. Uh, so I chose three movies that are uh, that have come out recently mm -hmm. that uh, are sort of in limited release, but um, three that I've been uh, wanting to check out. And that would be The Taste of Things. Mm-hmm. All of Us Strangers, and Perfect Days. I'm like mostly caught up with my Oscar movies this year, but those, even though All of Us Strangers wasn't nominated, which, or was it? No. No. Yeah. Not for nothing? Yeah. I, it got a lot of buzz anyway. I'm hearing it's good. But um, yeah, I'd say, and I think those have all been released as of now. Perfect Days maybe is just an limited release, but um. I saw that trailer for Perfect Days before Poor Things mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago, and it blew me away. Like, I didn't even know it was coming out. I don't think I've even seen a, a Vim Vendors movie before, but I'm like, this... And I love Japanese films. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'm just like, this is captivating. <laughs> so, yeah. all of us strangers criminally shut out from the Oscars, along with the Iron Claw, which was my favorite. Oh, God, last I know. Year. It's just like, Ugh. not one nomination, um, two. I just saw a Taste of Things. It had just come out in the AMC 24 near me, and I saw mm. it on Friday. It is so French, and it really made yeah, me want to eat. That. Oh, yeah. I, I've heard you should not watch that if you're hungry. <laughs> no, the, like, the first 20 minutes is just like silent cooking. And you're just like... Mm. Man. Entranced into the movie. <laughs> Right, just getting hungrier and hungrier. <laughs> and then I right this this popcorn isn't cutting it. I gotta <laughs> this popcorn is trash. <laughs> this is fine cuisine on the screen. And then uh, perfect days is I don't know when the hell that's coming around, but I will be watching it tomorrow morning because I just got a link, and I'm like finally. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> so there's definitely a lot of elusive films this year, and it's pretty frustrating um but you know we can't control that can we yeah yeah you do what you can it's even more difficult for me because i'm in kind of a rural area and there's a theater that's a little farther away that has a lot of the more Mm -hmm. um uh limited uh release films but the one that's closest to me which is still like 20 minutes away just kind of has the the basic stuff so yeah I love although i did that. see zone of interest there which yeah. i was which surprised me that they even carried it but um yeah i th- I think the the one amc that that covers a lot of that stuff has taste of things now so i'll have to find some time very nice now looking into the future what's a film that you hasn't released yet that you're most excited to see hands down Dune Part Two. There you go. Without question. Absolutely. My probably my most anticipated movie uh since Oppenheimer. Uh we were talking about this a little before we started. Um I, obviously Dune Part One was incredible. Uh just such a an amazing sci-fi film and such good cast. So I'm excited to see uh what the next chapter is. You're adding Austin Butler and Florence Pugh. Mm-hmm. into the mix here which uh you know that's that's going to be even better um make make the movie even better and uh yeah i think this is you know shaping up to be one of the best sci-fi franchises ever you know coming and, from such a visionary director too mm-hmm. in villeneuve um and it's uh the first one blew me away so i'm really excited to see part two yeah, literally every single reaction I have heard out of this movie is just masterpiece, masterpiece, masterpiece. And I'm like, well, so close. Don't have to wait too much longer. So we're almost there. Oh, yeah. So, but. Oh, absolutely. I, I hope it can uh, sweep all the technical awards again at the Oscars this year. Um, I don't, hopefully, based off of it, uh, I don't think that's going to be a hard I don't think that's going to be, yeah. I can't imagine there's going to be a ton of competition unless, you know, Furiosa shapes up to be similar to yeah. Fury Road. That's true. But that's a good point. That that would be quite the fist fight for all the technical awards, seeing yeah. as both, both previous films won all of them. And then it's just like, right. nope, this time we got to fight. Sure, sure. I mean, you might even see uh, uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes um, in the mix there, maybe for for visual effects at least. Um, the fact that none of them have won that Oscar, I know, is complete nonsense. Oh yeah, I was just rewatching those in the last couple of weeks, and I'm like, this looks Ow. real. Yeah, Ow. this is crazy. It's like. You you show me this film and you tell me this is not the best visual effects you've seen this year. And that happened how many times? I, mm-hmm. It blows my mind. But sure. how crazy would that be? Is that like they thought the fran- we all thought the franchise was over. 
And they're like, nope, fourth one. And then that's the one that finally wins an Oscar. Yeah. Mm. But Yeah. no, That would it's be cool. it would be cool because Furiosa and Kingdom of the Panel of the Apes are my two most anticipated films this year. Mm. And that that's a wild fight for technical awards that's gonna happen Sure, this sure. year. So I'm just imagining what if Oppenheimer did get released in the same year as Dune Part Two. Ugh. Man. I mean, yeah. It, imagine if Dune had been released in November, right? Like it was supposed to. And that would be a, a fist fight. Mm I hmm mean, Oh my god. it would be like a, I think it'd be back and forth, you know, like you got to give sound to Oppenheimer, but maybe give visual effects to Dune. And it's like, uh, you know, production design, who, who the hell knows? And it's so crazy too because we could have had a Nolan Scorsese Villeneuve fight. Wild time for movies. Wild Yeah. time. And best a best director is already stacked this year. You know, when when Greta Gerwig doesn't even get nominated. I was very surprised well I shouldn't be surprised at this point a lot more of the international film flair getting recognized Yeah. now that they've shaken up the academy which is for the best but I know a lot of people are very disappointed that Greta Gerwig didn't get nominated because you know Barbie directed itself uh, just like Dune Sure. the <laughs> So Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. And you're right, it's it's tough this year. Um because I mean I, I wouldn't take out Jonathan Glazer or Justine Trier. So I don't I don't know who you take out for Greta, but It's yeah, tough. I was I was bummed about that too. But so one of the things that a lot of people get bummed about is when they hear that another remake is coming <laughs> segues. Um, but Good what do you feel like is a film that deserves to actually get a remake? I thought about this for a long time, and this might be blasphemous to, to people who love this movie, but my thought was broadcast news. Uh, God. you put it in like a modern context with with technology. I mean, news is so different now. Yeah. That movie has not aged well technologically, you know, Mm -hmm. and just like the way... news was you had cable news in the 80s when that movie was made but also it, it was so focused still on the three networks because the you know that jack nicholson lead actor character is supposed to be like a peter jennings or a, a dan rather you know what i mean Yeah. one of those big network guys and yeah the, these days there's twitter there's so many different um smaller news outlets that are relevant and are keeping up with the with network news cable news is probably bigger than it's ever been so yeah i think maybe you keep the same character dynamics Mm -hmm. you know and i um i even have a recasting uh idea too i'll get to Okay. that in a second but you uh, you put the you get same character dynamics there the love triangle Mm uh, -hmm. sort of thing and apply that to the modern news Um, landscape I think that'd be interesting maybe even get James L. Brooks to, Brooks to write the script at least produce it you know because I was going it to is say, get one Sorkin of his masterworks on it. <laughs> I, that would be even better you know maybe 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 the newsroom was Sorkin's answer to broadcast news I don't know but Kind um, of, right? in a way yeah but my recasting for that so we go with uh, something different we have uh, Io Adebri Mm. in the Holly Hunter part, Lakeith Stanfield in the Albert Brooks part, and Michael B. Jordan in the William Hurt part. So you still have, like, sort of the smart, quirky female, Mm -hmm. the dorky guy, and then the hunky guy, you know. Um, What a James what a L. Brooks, hit. if you're listening, call me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll there write you go. it. <laughs> We sold it here first. <laughs> give Jacob his give Jacob his cut <laughs> and make it happen. That Uh, that's that'd be a very great. talented cast, though. That's a very interesting cast. Oh, and even throw like instead of like Jack Nicholson, throw Denzel in. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Absolutely. See? Now we're Hit, rolling hit, here. hit. Uh, there you go. Right. I'll I'll cut you in on that. <laughs> I'll take that's a good half one. a I'll take a half a percent. Right. And Just then you give have me. Spike Lee direct. You know, you get Denzel involved, right?
that even puts a more interesting kind of like you could do some social commentary. That's very that. interesting. <laughs> See, this the, this is how you do a remake. So there you go. Uh, exactly. Now, Jacob, what's your fondest memory of going to the movies? Uh, I mean, you know, you know as well as I, as movie lovers, that's like a sacred place for us, right? Mm -hmm. The theater. Um, and I've I've got a lot. This was hard to choose from. Um, but the first one I thought of, a, a lot of the times these are from when you're a kid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the first one I thought of was when I was in high school. My senior year uh, was 2012, um, and uh, m my group of friends and I had been watching a lot of the Marvel movies coming out the last years, couple of years before that, Captain America and Thor and everything, and we were all really, really looking forward to the Avengers. Mm -hmm. Came out around May 2012. Um, so it was our senior year. We had the senior dinner boat cruise that was like, it's like a tradition in our school, all the seniors go out on this cruise ship and have a dinner, little dance little thing, like a send-off for the year. And we we get back from that about 8 o'clock and I'll go see the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, we were like, uh, we were all probably dog-tired, but it's, you know, it's Avengers. we're really looking forward to seeing it. It's the Avengers. We had to make it happen. <laughs> and it was amazing. It exceeded our expectations, you know? And it was, when I look back on it now, it's almost like a historic movie moment because... yeah of what the MCU was doing and sort of how we had never really seen anything like that with comic, comic book movies before. And um, just uh, being able to uh, have that moment of anticipation pay off and to be with your friends like that, it was um, uh, special. So yeah, that's, that's the first one I thought of. Oh, I have a lot of it. I have a lot of memories about my uh, seeing of the Avengers not the, not the least being I had a four hour accounting event at 8 a.m. that Friday oh, morning wow. and I went to the midnight <laughs> premiere of Avengers. <laughs> I was tired and that was boring. Yeah. Four hours. Sure, sure. But it was an experience. Right. I'm like, Worth I, it, can't, though. I can't not go to this thing and I cannot miss the Avengers. Yeah. So <laughs> we're doing both things. Because uh, I was, a, it was the end of my sophomore year of college when the Avengers came out. So, mm -hmm. oh, what a special time for all of us movie nerds and comic book nerds alike. Yeah, right. Urging at the That's, theater. Yeah, that was that was really great. Now, Jacob, what's a film that really exceeded your expectations? Uh, for, you know, for this one, I thought of the most recent example. Mm -hmm. um that i came across and that was wonka so last year when the, the trailers for wonka were coming out they were at, in front of like every movie Literally. uh for a long time <laughs> um and i i kept saying i didn't think it was going to be good i like chalamet mm -hmm. you know it looked like it had a good cast but i and to be fair um i hadn't seen the Paddington movies at the time. So I wasn't um, familiar with the director. Um, yeah. Still need to remedy, remedy that actually. But uh, what's the director's name? Paul King. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of the mighty. Boosh um, theme. <laughs> so weird. So sorry. What'd you say? Cause he was part of the mighty Boosh. I don't know if you've ever heard of that show. It's one of the oh oh yeah sure yeah I, I didn't I didn't know that no there's way. a there's a couple well of considering cameos. that that's surprising yeah well that when he made Paddington like what because <laughs> there's some yeah compared to the Mighty Boosh yeah there's cameos in Wonka that are a bunch of Mighty Boosh people I, hmm. I was sitting there I'm like no way like wait a minute <laughs> so. Interesting little tidbit, but continue. Huh. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, Wonka was not promoted as a musical at all. So you see everything outside of the musical numbers in that trailer, and you're like, what are they doing here? I don't get it. But I saw it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, um, 
And yeah, I was blown away. The music is so great in that movie. Um, it, and just ties everything together really well. And it's just so much fun. You know, I, I wasn't expecting it to have that, uh, that kind of tone, that Paul King sort of thing that he's going mm -hmm. for with that, the Paddington movies. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, maybe I had some bad, some kind of stigma against it with the, the Tim Burton Willy Wonka movie, which I didn't really like. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I and I have such an affinity for the original, the Gene Wilder movie. Yeah. Um, that I just given what I saw in that trailer, I'm like, I don't know. But I it ended up being one of my favorite movies of last year. Um, so yeah, they these studios just need to start promoting musicals as musicals. And you know. Just let it be. Please. Which, which also, Warner Brothers, Wonka's also one of their favorite movies from last year. Because <laughs> it has cracked $600 million worldwide. So that's good crazy. for it. Wow. It's great. It's still making money. Right. Which is crazy. Now, yeah. uh, my favorite part of the movie, for all five minutes he was in it, was Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. <laughs> did for oh, those yeah. who did for those who did not hear him present at the BAFTAs, I'm gonna <laughs> recite what he said introducing best director. <laughs> so enjoy. Oompa Loompa Dupa Dee Dee. Now the best director category. And let's just <laughs> let's just remember he's grumpy as hell Man. while saying this. Oompa yeah, Loompa. Right. He's just <laughs> stupidy dong. Most of these films were frankly too long. <laughs> Oompa Loompa Doopity Da. But for some reason the nominees are. <laughs> and then you read the nominees. Oh yeah. That's fantastic. I I just saw that on TikTok like an hour ago and I'm uh -huh. like, yep, this is why I love Hugh Grant. He is such a grumpy bastard, but he leans yeah, into it. He's really, really, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. He really leans into it. Like he uh he puts out all these ridiculous interviews and you know talks about how much he hates the movie, but I think it's it's starting to feel like it's a little tongue in cheek too. Oh, he's having you know, too much like, fun with it. <laughs> too much fun. Uh, and we're all just living it. We're we're living his fun. Uh, but I I felt compelled to read that. Bring on Wonka, Wonka 2, and more Oompa Loompa. Oh, human. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we, yeah, we need a spinoff with him. <laughs> he, he would murder somebody if they made him do that a whole entire feature like film. Oh, yeah. Give give him a series on Max at, the, at this point. Why not? You know, make Just him series. Him on the him out in the island, yeah. protecting his uh yeah, <laughs> his nuts that Willie keeps stealing. Oh my! Now I don't know how much of a reader you are, Jacob, but what's one written work that you would like to see adapted into a film? Well, Shane, I'm not uh, not as much as a, a reader as I'd like to be. I'm Fair. leaning a little more into the movies lately. So I did a little research on this and I actually found a novel that I started reading and really enjoyed and is actually famous for not being able to be adapted. Uh, this is a novel called A Confederacy of Dunces. I don't know if you've heard of it. I just um, read that this year. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving it so far. I'm not too far into it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, for those who don't know, it's about this uh, this morbidly obese man in New Orleans, um, who lives with his mother. He's very intellectual. He He's kind of like a neckbeard in, in today's parlance. Mm -hmm. Like, if I were to make, if I were to write the script, if I were to adapt that, I would just write him as a neckbeard. Yeah. You know, like your your typical Discord mod or whatever you think of yeah. when, um, you know, I say that. But he's, you know, he has a master's degree in medieval history, yet he's unemployed. <laughs> and this all takes place in like 1960s New Orleans and that's a really big part of the story mm -hmm. and the way people talk and that's really interesting and that would be cool to see on the screen I think um, sort of recreating that world 
you could even modernize it, put it yeah. in modern day New Orleans or um, <clears throat> um, depending on uh, what tone you wanted to go with. But um, yeah, it was uh, uh, actually it was um, going to be adapted by Harold Ramis, I believe, in the 80s, 82. Um, they tried to adapt it with Belushi and then maybe uh, Chris Farley before before that. Um, or something like that, and then um, that never happened. But uh, yeah, that's um, it's it's very cinematic from what I've read. It is it it creates a world. It, it sort of paints a picture of this mm -hmm. very specific time in history, and and this very very interesting uh sort of unlikable character but also hilarious and it's, it's like an absurdist comedy in a way so mm. i think that would be a good one. Oh, it would it would be so much fun i heard nick offerman was trying to make it happen uh, and it makes me sad that then that didn't uh make it through either i i don't get why it's so like so hard for this one to actually make it to the screen but my only hope is that someday when it does they do it right. Mm -hmm. I'm compelled to start writing the script. Just from what I've read. It would be easy. I mean, the dialogue writes itself. It's all there. Mm -hmm. You would you have to pull a, so Pull a Cohen's, them just reading No Country for Old Men and just typing it out as they go along. <laughs> well, it won them an Oscar, so... <laughs> if it's I'm, not I'm just trying wrong, to get mine. <laughs> don't fix it. Exactly. <laughs> now, uh, shifting gears to a couple specific aspects of film. Now, trailers are a very interesting thing in film today, whether they're giving away the whole movie or you have no idea what the hell the movie's about. And I feel like there's no in between <laughs> anymore. But, yeah. Jacob, what's your favorite movie? Yeah. Trailer? Uh, this one was easy for me, and it's uh, one that always sticks in my head. I remember watching this theater or this trailer in theaters multiple times, uh, and that is the Social Network. Mm. The first time I saw that trailer, it blew me away. You've got that um, <clears throat> the children's choir singing "Creep," and those opening shots of just just graphics of Facebook, just. People sending messages, sending a poke, whatever it is. This is, you know, old Facebook, Oops. obviously. And <laughs> <laughs> I was I was out there poking some people. Um, and it was I was in high school. It was a time in my life when Facebook was really important to me. And I was really getting into film too and starting mm -hmm. to figure out like who directors are and following award seasons and stuff like that. Um and I think that was sort of my first foray into it. Um, but yeah, that trailer was so captivating too, because I think it gave just enough away to keep you interested because you knew who Zuckerberg was mm. and sort of in a way, and you kind of knew the story of how he started Facebook and uh, it, the trailer gives you just enough to show you how it's going to unfold, but not mm. exactly. And uh, I was a big Jesse Eisenberg fan at the time too. Uh, Zombieland and Adventureland had just came out around then, and I remembered uh, really liking those at the time. So, uh, yeah, that's probably my favorite by far. And oddly enough, that was like the first David Fincher movie I saw. So it was really like a or almost symbolic for me as my first mm -hmm. big foray into into great directors like that and now he's one of my favorites ever there you go the they've certainly had some great trailers for Fincher films and social network obviously is a great one and that's an iconic trailer at this point so it's like that's a high bar to set and that's also a very high bar to set watching that for your first Fincher film it's just like bam masterpiece oh so, yeah absolutely. still probably my favorite Fincher film too I don't blame it at all. It is an incredible film and still very uncomfortably relevant today because of social mm -hmm. media. But shifting gears a little bit into some music, 
What's your favorite use of a song in a movie? Oh, there's so many good ones, man. Mm -hmm. This one was hard. Trying to uh, narrow down. I, I want to give you I want to give you two honorable mentions and okay. then I'll go into my my big one. So just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. So from good. Big Lebowski. <laughs> that whole sequence is yep. insane. Yep. And uh great song. Uh Stuck in the Middle with You from Reservoir Dogs. Yep. Is one of my favorites ever. I tried to pick one from Pulp Fiction, and I'm like, I can't pick one. They're all too good. That's so I'll just hard. say Pulp Fiction in general. Mm -hmm. But my the one I first thought of that I really love, just because of the way it's used, is Spill the Wine in Boogie Nights. Oh. Now, this comes at a, a kind of early point in the film. Starts with the colonel pulling up to the pool party mm -hmm. at, at Jack Horner's house. You're introduced to him. And then after that, after he pulls up, it's basically all one shot. And you hear Spill the Wine playing in the background a little bit. And, you know, you've got mm -hmm. the sort of the speak talky thing that they do at the beginning of that song. And uh, you you follow um, the driver into the party. You see uh, Buck and Becky talking about uh, her look. And his look, and that, you know, you move on through the party to uh, Maurice and uh, Amber Waves. Amber, honey, baby, please! Trying to get <laughs> in, uh, into the movie, you know. Back to, you know, one of the girls doing coke. And then right as the song is starting to climax, the pool, the camera goes right into the pool. Yeah. And it's like you're immersed into this world. You've almost... You've already been introduced to everybody, and you're just, you feel like you're at the party. Mm -hmm. You're just sort of walking along, sort of m making your way through. And I feel like, and that they play almost the entire song there. And I feel like that's just such a great use of the song itself and being able to time that out perfectly. And I love a good one or like that too, anyways. Um, and there's so many other examples from that movie too. Um, but that one in particular stood out to me. Absolutely. That's such a good one. It works so perfectly. That scene is so great setting things up. I think the one that I think of when I think Boogie Nights is Sister Christian, just because how oh. insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> things get at the end of that movie. Sure. That's <laughs> uh that that scene like makes still makes me uncomfortable. It should. Um, and and like I that's probably the most famous example from that and it, it is great mm -hmm. but no those were all fantastic ones obviously I'm partial to the Big Lebowski one as well mm -hmm. so there you go now thinking of listening to scores if you had to pick a score you're going to sit down and listen to one what score are you going to um, I thought of two here these are two that I actively do listen to at least once or twice a month mm -hmm. um, across the spider verse. That's such an incredible score should have been nominated this year, by the way, I think. And um, for, for Oscars anyways. And uh, I, it's just so unique and like follows the emotion of the movie perfectly. And you can almost listen to the score and picture what is happening in the movie just from the emotion of the music, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, exactly where you are. That's also maybe because I've seen across the spider verse like five times now, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one I thought of too is uh, Babylon. I love that score so much. I, I I'm a huge fan of that movie. And I, I could, you could probably say that for any Hurwitz score, like mm -hmm. whiplash or La La, La La Land too. Um, but something about I, I'm a big jazz fan too, and something about like that big brassy big band sound, mm -hmm. and you think of the the emotions tied to that music, especially uh, I think there's one song on there called um, like Diego's theme or something or Manny's mm -hmm. theme, um, 
that just it slows down and gets away from the big band stuff and it captures exactly like the melancholy mm -hmm. that that those characters are feeling and that point in the movie and um i just it's so well made too just every piece of music in that so yeah it just gets me excited that that first song like from the uh from the opening scene or yeah the the first party scene i'll just that's like my my pump up music now just i love uh, it that i had <laughs> just stuck in my head for like two months <laughs> after i saw babylon and i had, oh, a, I had a press press screen for it at uh in dolby wow and it was like holy crap yeah <laughs> and uh. it went hard and like the whole montage at the end with it too yes it just oh that babylon was a lot Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot it, it going was. on. Um, could have been a little leaner from my experience, but that music, mm -hmm. killer. Those performances, killer. Yeah, There's incredible. just so many great things about it. It was so straight. It obviously got such middling reviews and then kind of just like dissipated. But yeah, that, was... that score deserved a lot of respect for sure. Oh, absolutely. Hurwitz is a genius. And mm. Chazelle is a genius. That movie is so well made. And I was disappointed at the middling uh, reaction it got. But big, bold movies like that aren't for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, I well, think. If you want to hear a lot of love for Babylon, you should also tune in to the Oscar re, <laughs> uh, re evaluating the Oscars from mm -hmm. last year, because I can guarantee you, Aaron is going to be pushing hard for Babylon everywhere. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds about right. Now, my last question for you, Jacob, is what do you, what's the one thing that you wish movies would stop doing? Uh, you know, so there's this trend I've noticed, mm -hmm. especially, this isn't only superhero movies, but it's a lot of superhero movies where this the CGI is just so bad in some of these superhero movies. Like I think of quantum mania specifically or the flash and like, you know, just, I don't know if it's rushed or if we're not giving CGI artists enough time or whatever it is. Um, but yeah. So like Modoc specifically in quantum mania was like, what are we doing? And then, you know, the, I don't even know what to call it. The uh, uh, blast from the past tornado that the Flash goes through at the end of that movie. I'm just like, did I? What did I do to deserve this? This is not good. <laughs> what did um, any of these dead actors do to deserve yeah. this? What did Christopher Reeve do to, to deserve <laughs> this? Or Adam West, for that matter? Good God! <laughs> I thought that movie was bad before that happened, but. Um, and it, I haven't seen Madam Web yet, but I'm sure there's plenty of bad CGI there. You know what's crazy is that's the worst. <laughs> that's like the least of the worries <laughs> when you're watching Madam Oh, sure. Web. Yeah. And <laughs> sorry, I was just triggered <laughs> from my experience watching it almost a week ago at this point. It's it's <laughs> not good. Um, uh, but like you can barely see some of the CGI sometimes because how bad the editing and the camera work is. Oh, um, man. But no, it's it's a horrible trend. And basically, Godzilla minus one just like rolled up to a party and started decking mm -hmm. people in the face, just being like, "Oh, right. you think you could do CGI, can't you?" And then they did it with thirteen million dollars. So crazy. Like, they had an interview with the director, and they're like, we heard that this only cost $15 million. And he's like, I wish it was less than that. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, it yeah, deserves that, is that crazy. Oscar nomination that it got for sure. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. it's like, 
how do you embarrass a whole entire country's worth of big budget films by producing a $13 million movie that looks better than your movie? <laughs> and oh, yeah. Even better than like, any Marvel movie that's come out in the last five years. Yeah. Even like, it's basically since Thanos. Like, yeah. We haven't had that great a CGI since like Thanos. And can you imagine if they did that crap with Thanos? Yeah, I mean that would take you right out of Endgame. Exactly. Right? Like that just would ruin the entire culmination of the MCU. And it's just like y'all need to do better. But mm. treat them right. <laughs> Don't abuse your uh visual effects people. Well, I think Across the Spider Verse too is a good example. Even it, if it is an animated movie, there's lots and lots of digital work that goes into Tons that. Tons of animators, and they took their time with it. They pushed the release date, said it's not ready. And when you take your time with that and put in um, the right amount of effort with time, you obviously you get an incredible result like that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think other movies can could learn that lesson. Absolutely. So yeah, take some patience, Hollywood. Um, but Jacob, I always like to wrap up this show by having my guests ask me a question. So what would you like to oh. ask the Wasteland reviewer? Oh man, okay, well. Hmm. Well, you had already mentioned your two most anticipated movies of the year. Um so I uh, uh I won't ask that. How about um, if you out of all the movies in 2023, like if you had to pick one favorite, what would it be? Maybe not best, but favorite. Oh, if I had to pick the film that I the one film that I'm definitely going to rewatch the most at anything that came out in 2023 is John Wick Chapter 4. <laughs> uh, awesome. I could watch the beautiful three hours over and mm -hmm. over and over again. I could watch it over and over again like John Wick fell down those stairs. <laughs> oh my God, it's gorgeous. And if anybody in the right mind paid it enough attention it should be getting like cinematography attention for the oscars because my god it's a gorgeous film but it just i'm such a big action movie fan and mm -hmm. we're in peak action movie territory with the likes of mission impossible and john wick oh, yeah. going on at the same mm -hmm. time and no doubt if, even dead reckoning part one or if you want to leave out the part one no matter what still dead reckoning <laughs> like that was incredible too but like oh john wick chapter four is definitely the one that i'm gonna i enjoyed the most i'm definitely gonna come back around again i've i've watched barbie three times already since it came out but like because <laughs> it's just so fun but like if like that john wick i've seen twice now and it was still so satisfying the second time i watched it and on my glorious 4k that I bought for it and it was oh, so yeah. worth it. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm sure it's beautiful. Yeah. As of right now, that and Oppenheimer were my top 4K uh purchases of 2023. Oh, sure. So definitely yeah. John Wick Chapter 4 is the one my most enjoyable fun film that I nice. will definitely keep coming back to. And like if it ended like it did, I think it'd be uh -huh. perfect. Will I complain sure. if they were like, <laughs> just kidding? Um, no. <laughs> but I'll still watch it. Um, but it's one of those things where it's just like, it felt like such a great ending to that story, too. Um, it just so good from start to finish, all the insane action and seeing Scott Atkinson, like Scott Atkins dressing up in a fat suit. And then just doing crazy martial arts with a grill in is <laughs> it's a it's a special moment in cinema in 2023. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Jacob, thank you so much for joining me and talking some movies. 
Yes, yes. Thank you for having me, Shane. This was fun. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.